Hello, I'm Mary Bradshaw. I'm the Director of Visual Arts here at the Yukon Arts Centre, based in Whitehorse, Yukon. We acknowledge we are in the traditional territories of the Kwanlun Dun First Nation and the Tahan Kwachan Council. We'd also like to acknowledge today the recent passing of Kwanlun Dun Elder Annie Smith and send our condolences to her family and to the greater Kwanlun Dun community. Annie Smith was known for her exceptional beadwork and sewing and probably most importantly, how she so generously shared her skills and knowledge with the community. Today, we're here to talk about another exceptional Northern artist, Shuvanaya Shuna. The Art Centre is really excited to be able to host this major solo exhibit, which has been organized by the Power Plant Toronto to tour across the country. On November 15th, we held a talk with Josh Human from the Power Plant and exhibition curator Nancy Campbell. Unfortunately, the first few minutes got cut off, and so I'm here to reintroduce uh, our talk. Josh starts with asking Nancy, how did she first become interested in Inuit art? Well, I'd be delighted and I, I want to thank the power plant uh, for organizing this tour. I think it's so important for people across our country to be exposed to the work of artists uh, from the north. And Shuvanai is, is a, an artist that is a little bit different than what we expect Inuit art to look like. And I always like to start these conversations with a preface that what brought me to Shuvanai and, and a few of the other artists I've worked with in the past it is just how progressive and contemporary and current they are. Um, that they're using all the imagery that, that their ancestors, their elders uh, had used in the studios um, in Kingite formerly known as Cape Dorset, where Shuvanai is from and have adapted and changed them. And Shuvanai has such a unique and special way of doing this that makes her, in my mind, a contemporary artist who is, who is Inuit, but um, you know, takes the Inuit art traditions that we see in some of the elders and, and twists them and kind of spins them on their head. This is, this, um, this picture in the exhibition is one of my personal favorites because it does combine a lot of traditional imagery that you would associate with Inuit art, um, but kind of conflates them and, and confuses them. So what we see is, is basically a portrait of a woman, um, if you look closely and the trick is with all of Shuvanai's work and for the people who've had the, um, the experience of actually being able to get up close and if you can see it on your screen, it's a bit harder. This is a massive drawing. It's about eight feet long by four feet, no, even bigger than that. It's a big drawing, a, a, like an enormous drawing. Yeah, definitely it, monumental. Yeah, and, and, and keep in mind it's done in pencil crayon which is a very common um, medium for artists in the North to use. And that has historical reasons, which I can talk about later, but um, just imagine, you know, for our younger viewers or, or anyone who's used a pencil crayon in their life, how, how long it would take, how, how hard it would be on your hand to draw in this much detail with a pencil crayon. So I always like to tell, people, especially in these virtual talks, that this is a pencil crown drawing, which, which even makes it more impressive in my mind. But what we see here is, is her, her ability to, to make people into a hybrid sort of animal human. And you see this in a lot of the drawings. So this one I think is one of the most successful ones. Her hair, uh, for sake of better word, is a polar bear. Polar bears, when you see them in the north or, or in a zoo or wherever, are not actually bright white. They're actually a yellowish color. So that is what a polar bear would look like. Over her, if you're looking at your screen, the left ear is a walrus. You can see the tusks coming down. But if you look even closer, you can see the ear itself is a swan. 
and you can see it's wrapped around with the wing kind of embracing her cheek. The eye, eyeballs are actual globes, which are replicated in the background. Um, she does use the globe as a um, icon in a lot of the works. And there is a serpent that wraps around the back that is covered in eyeballs and globes. Um, and it runs around behind her head. Um, and for sake of time, I won't get on, but the hair itself is so spectacular. It is multicolored hair. You have blonde hair, you have gray hair, you have red hair, brown hair, black hair. And at the end of each strand of hair is a tiny planet. And this beautiful uh, array of color is really representative of how Shubhanai sees the world. And we may, we may touch on this later in, in, in our discussion, but I don't know how, how far we're gonna get in uh, 45 minutes, but Shubhanai's world is a world that is very inclusive and not, it doesn't only include animals, um, and, and the world we live in, but all the people. She never different, differentiates between a race, you know, hair is hair and hair comes in many colors, skin comes in many colors. So, uh, and, then, and then at the base of the drawing, just from, from a compositional view, we have this beautiful pink uh, parka that just kind of sets the whole composition on fire. It's a fantastic, fantastic, drawing. It is. And I think, you know, as you point out, this, this really, uh, you know, reflects Shubhanai's, you know, I inclusivity and, and a sort of holistic understanding of, you know, that, that the whole world is, is to sort of together. Yeah, uh, yeah. In, in a lot of ways. Um, so I figured, you know, I would launch in with like big broad question, which is how did you become first become interested in Inuit art? Well, I just, I consider myself extremely lucky, first of all, uh, to have had the experience to be able to travel so far north and to meet these artists in, in, in the community of, of Kingite, again, Cape Dorset, and work closely with them over a period of 15 years. That's, that's very unusual for a curator to be able to spend an, an extended period of time. And it was really by happenstance. I, I, I kind of blame it on the fact that I grew up in Winnipeg and Winnipeg has the most incredible collection of Inuit art in the world. Um, but uh, you know, that, that just was, was not a passion or an interest. What really I was, was a curator of contemporary art and I remained to be that. And I really did see the work of artists like Annie Pudigu or Shubhanaya Shuna as being contemporary artists, women, at my, around my age making work that kind of rocked my world. And as a curator, that's what we do. We find things that we, we think are interesting and hopefully other people will think they're interesting. Um, over 15 years of traveling up there and working closely, not only with those two women, but with, with other, other artists in the community and, and meeting the elders. Um, you know, developed into something of, of, a, of a passion project, if nothing else. And um, I continue, I love drawing as a medium as well. So, you know, a lot of things came together. I had great mentors and great teachers um, that I traveled with. So, you know, it's funny how life takes its course. When I started out in university, I, I had no intention of curating Inuit art, that's for sure, so. Yeah, and so I wonder, like when you think back on, on your trips to the North, <coughs> um, can, you, can you recall sort of that first moment that you encountered Shuvenai's work? And what was your initial reaction well, it was funny because I initially went up to visit Annie Pudigu, and for the viewers who may not um, know about Annie, um, she'd be somebody you could Google. She had a very extraordinary life and career. Uh, and there, Annie and Shuva and I are first cousins, along with another artist who's since passed named Siasi Keneally. And I went up um, to do an exhibition of the three cousins. And I traveled with Pat Feely, who has an Inuit art gallery in, in Toronto and an amazing mentor to me and really got 
to know these women. Um, and Shuva and I was just beginning to come to the studio. Um, her drawings, they were very early. They didn't capture my attention in the same way that, that Annie did at the time, but over the trips that I made and the, the amount of work that Shuva and I did and how quickly she developed um, her skill and her work ethic and her, her passion, I could see a, a change in the work and then uh, it became more fantastic, more experimental. She really worked outside the box of, the, of what the co-op was advocating at that time. Mm -hmm. The co-op now where the artists work is very progressive and supports the artists in, in making imagery of whatever they want, as opposed to things like polar bears and seals and hunting scenes, which were the more traditional things that, that we have come to know as the Inuit art. But Shiva and I just took off like a bullet. And then she started wor working large, which also came, like that's only been about 10 years that the, the large paper has been available. Mm -hmm. And Shiva and I can really master the large drawing. She doesn't get tired. She can work big. She works without a sketch. She just goes straight into the drawings and went from black and white to color. Um, again, you know, on these visits, I would just see these huge shifts in her work to what, what culminated in the power plant show. Um, and I, I just thought there was something so special and she is a, an, a, an amazing person and a very warm and loving and um, creative person. So she was a delight to work with. So it was, it was kind of just by, again, by one of those things, just by watching and seeing how, how she worked and her mind worked and then seeing like an explosion of talent that, that uh, you know, no one can expect, like, you know, anticipate. Yeah, and so, I mean, so you've sort of touched on this, um, but I wonder if you could, um, you know, think about some of the characteristics that really makes Shuvenai's work stand out compared to her predecessors, but also her contemporaries. You know, sort of like what, what, what is the it in Well, Shuvenai? I think what makes Shuvenai so special, like she really is um, an artist artist. I have yet to meet an artist, like contemporary Southern, Northern, who is not gobsmacked by this work, like everybody, all, artists love her work. Mm -hmm. And she really does uh, channel what she's thinking. She is, she is fan like fantastic in the true sense of the word fantastic. She does, she draws what she's thinking about. She's, you know, some equate her to a surrealist. I, I don't really think that is the right connection, um, but she does really mire her imagination mm -hmm. as opposed to observation. And you don't see, you see it in some Inuit uh, drawings, someone like Kunoyuak, where they, where they take something and make it, you know, not a replicate of like what a polar bear looks like. But what Shuvenai does is take take it to the next level. It always it doesn't always make sense. There's always a mesh of the contemporary, the traditional, the fantastical, the popular culture, and she makes no grand statements. I find her work very joyful, even though it's full of what what people term as monsters. I I wouldn't use that term. Mm -hmm. um, she she really is an artist of the imagination and um, she's not there to make a political statement or a um, although sometimes there there are bleeds into that mm -hmm. but it's just the pencil goes down and she she just rolls with it and I think that combined with the way she grew up watching her grandmother who is Pitsila Kashuna, her her cousin, her cousins, her 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 colleagues at the co-op, and her incredible sense of composition and color, along with this just like amazing imagination that 
that she really does not harness in any way. So I think that's really unlike any who 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 drew what she saw. You know, she was the yeah. narrative illustrator, although she was narrating contemporary life. Shuvanai does that, but it is it is much more fanciful, and there are no um, clear explanations for for everything in the drawing. So right. And, and so you've mentioned the, the co-op. And so I'm gonna bring up uh, a, another picture. We'll go to, to the next, how do I do that? Uh, uh, oh, there we go. Um, and, so, uh, and so this drawing is also in the, in the exhibition. Um, it's a, a bird's eye view and, and uh, Shuvenai has, has drawn a few bird's eye view images. I wonder if you could talk about this. Um, and I recall that you mentioned this is sort of like, this is kind of uh, depicting the, her, her walk from like where she lives, like in, at least in part, from where she lives to where she works at the co-op. Um, and so maybe you could talk a little bit about the drawing, but also how does the co-op really function to like, well, that could be a whole other webinar. But, <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> we'll say the Reader's uh, Digest version. This thing here. Uh, I did want to include some aerial drawings. Shubhanai does do them on occasion. Historically, uh, in Inuit art, which is a short history, keep in mind, it really begins in and around like 1945, mm -hmm. um, as we know it, but that's for another uh, discussion. But aerial views were done and they were usually done by artists to illustrate areas for hunting. And they would be done by memory because people would not be in planes, um, you know, taking photographs. Like it would just be a way to, to locate places. Mm -hmm. So I think Shuva and I was doing this with the co-op. This is the old co-op. They now have a new building, which is fantastic. But this is the old co-op where I've been many times. And it is exactly the way it is set up. The, where the globes are it would be the walking street or the you could drive your truck there too. But there, um, so those globes would be, I guess, the joining of the worlds because on the left side um, are the administrative offices on my left and the, the apartments. And on the right side is the drawing studio and the print studio. And they are exactly, um, I don't know if they're exactly to scale per se, but they look exactly like that. Um, and why she would think that was a, you know, the, the perspective's a bit wonky, but why she would think that would be an interesting thing to record and why she would put the globes all along the center. Mm -hmm. I've, I've never had a clear answer. Of course, the co-op, she works every day. The co-op is run, Inuit run um, uh, artist studio, but it also includes the grocery store, the gas station, the water um, supply, the garbage pickup like a co-op you'd see in any mm -hmm. city that would, or town. Um, but it really, uh, it has been an incredible resource for, for the artists living in, in Cape Dorset over the years. It is changing slowly as, you know, now there's a bit of uh, internet up there, a little bit compared to none, like, like three years ago. So right. it's a bit slow on the take, but it has facilitated artists um, very well. And of course the Cape Dorset print release that's been going for 50 years has just been amazing and um, really has put Inuit art and incredible artists come from this community. And I think it is because of the co-op is so strong. Mm -hmm. um, and allows Shivanai a warm place to work, provides her with paper, pencil, crayons, and is the uh, place from which all the work is sent down south to a place in Toronto called um, Dorset Fine Arts, where, th where it is distributed to galleries around the world. So this, of course, was necessary or essential. It still is essential, but, you know, the, as we all know, especially during the pandemic, things change um, quickly and um, and the co-op will be changing 
perhaps, but it ha has been a perfect uh, environment for Shuba and I to work in. Uh, she lives alone and she works every day, Monday to Friday from nine till five, never misses a day. And, um, and is just the amount of work she produces is incredible. So um, yeah, that's what that picture. Awesome. Is. Yeah, I mean, I think in a lot of ways, you know, this this image, along with numerous others that have these, uh, you know, globes, uh, really was sort of like the inspiration behind the the exhibition title, Mapping Worlds. Yeah. Um, that she's, you know, rooted in this world. That she does have this fantastical, um, you know, view of of other. You know, we'll say the other, um, but uh, but also these these bird's eye views, you know, aerial views. Um, and so I wonder, uh, so you mentioned uh, the, the first project that you uh, pursued with Shub and I, uh, the Three Cousins exhibition. Um, you know, uh, not necessarily how did that come about, but um, sort of, you know, how did you juggle sort of, you know, including these three artists, um, each one with, you know, sort of like their own vision, but, you know, intersecting, overlapping, you know, uh, perspectives. Uh, into one exhibition and, and sort of, you know, what of Chauvenet ended up in that show? Well, that was so long ago. It was at the <laughs> uh, Art Gallery of Alberta. Um, yeah. And uh, I was encouraged by the director there, Catherine Crouston, to do an exhibition. And I'd been up looking at Annie's work and, um, and, and, saw Chauvenet's and Siassi's and I was you know that, that that was the early days like I was just blown away like it, like just fell in love immediately with Cape Dorset and with with these women and just knowing like their their artistic lineage like those that was a long time ago so it was really a love affair show in, a, in many ways but um, I found you know, how when people work in, in a cooperative situation uh, where, where they work side by side and, you know, you know, that looks good, I'll try that. Or that, that made a lot of money, I'll try that. Like there was a lot of interplay and, and Shiva and I was, you know, she's um, an Apache's um, uh, niece and just like, it's just, um, when you think of how these three young women came to art from the same place, but from different perspectives, it, it was just, it was really cool. So, yeah. and, and I knew very little about it and I'm a contemporary art curator and these were women making contemporary art and they should be seen as contemporary artists, you know, not in the basement of, you know, some gallery where they only had, um, you know, indigenous artists. That, and that was not too long ago. I'm so, right. so glad that that is slowly changing. Yeah. And so, and so, you, you know, sort of a foreshadowing of my, of my next question um, already is that, uh, like you've spent significant time with Shuva and I in the studio. I wonder, like, what is it like to be with her and to watch her work? And, you know, does she, like, is she silent? Does she talk? Is she listening to music? Like, what's, what's the, that whole creative environment like? Well, being in the, in the studio is a very special uh, experience. It is totally quiet, except for the radio, the CBC North which plays country music. Um, and there's very little banter. I thought there would be, a, you know, there's a few jokes, everyone's speaking in Uktatut, so, you know, maybe they're laughing at me, I don't know, but uh, they, uh, they get in, get to work, they have a break at 10, they have, they have lunch, then they have a break at three, and then they go home and um, they go to the coffee room and, you know, that's where the conversation happens. It's really like a workplace and it's considered disrespectful to, you know, be like chatting away to them when they're working. Uh, what I love about Shuva and I, and, and, 
And the artists are going there less and less. More and more artists are choosing to work at home, which I think is a shame in a way because there's so much kind of fostering back and forth. But, and so, some of the elders of course have passed away and it was really for the elder artists was a really nice gathering place, you know, so. Mm. Uh, but what, what amazes me with Shubhana is like, she'll get a big, it doesn't matter, the, but when she gets the big papers, she gets a pillow and puts it under her her belly. She's a tiny, tiny person, but to make herself comfortable and kind of lays on the paper and starts drawing with a fine liner, like a you know an ink uh, marker, mm-hmm. kind of like a very fine marker. And there's no sketch, like there's no. And this is like an eight foot piece of paper. You think you might want to know where like where the bear is going to go or the face is going to like. She just starts going and then she'll say to, well, Bill uh, Ritchie was the former director at the co-op and, uh, you know, can I have coffee break now or whatever? And sure, you know, and then the pen would come off the paper. Like it was astonishing. I've like, like, honestly, I've, I've, I've never seen anything like it. It just like flows out of her. And yeah, without an eraser or a sketch or a pencil mm-hmm. uh, or like nothing, just like full on. And does she, I mean, uh, like has she given any indication that she's coming to this drawing with a, with an idea in mind or it just happens? I've never heard that from mm-hmm. her, but you know, she'll just go in and start drawing like a job. Yeah. Then you you know out springs a drawing like which we'll see if we have time with the Titanic or something that you know has come because she's watched a movie like nobody's telling her what to draw and in fact you know sometimes it is challenging for the people that work at the co-op to help the artists come up with ideas because like you know once like if something sells well they'll just keep making the same drawing you know or a version of the same thing. So it's incredible what Shubha and I's done is, is she's just doing what she wants and mm-hmm. and she's doing amazingly well and winning significant uh, art awards all across Canada and the world. Yeah. Uh, it's not, you know, initially some, some of her Inuit uh, f- friends or colleagues would say things like, you know, that would never sell. And then, you know, of course it's selling to a whole new, group of collectors that have never collected uh, Inuit art before. So Mm -hmm. it really has broken that mold too. Great, so I'm gonna, we're gonna look at another image and skip ahead to uh, birthing scene. And uh, because you've already mentioned sort of, you know, these like quote unquote, like people will describe as monsters, um, but you know, there's, there's all sorts of, you know, human, animal and then hybrid transformed um, uh, beings. And so I wonder, you know, if you could sort of walk us through what we're looking at in this drawing. Yeah, this is one of two. I don't know if they both went to Yukon because we've had to switch the show uh, a few times because their work's on paper and they can only take so much sunlight Mm -hmm. for just people who aren't familiar with Yeah, I think up in Yukon, uh, the the other scene did, is not there. So yeah. I think I think this one yeah, is. It's, it's just a, a stipulation by some lenders, but they're both very right. similar. And I love these works. You know, I, I, the other one is called Happy Mother. I, I forget the name of this one off the top of my head. But again, it's, it's certainly not a woman in trauma. Mm-hmm. She has what would be a considered uh, a midwife, behind her it's a an animal in this case some sort of uh seabird or uh fantastical bird um you can see the woman who is giving birth with the blue hair uh looks more amazed than in pain uh her appendages her feet and her hands are again the transformed bits of the work one is a some sort of a claw, another one would be a flipper of some kind. And her foot, one foot is a caribou foot with a kind of a, a, or a caribou leg with the walrus foot or a seal foot. 
And the other leg is the, the tail fin of a fish. So again, I'm not sure what that's like, certainly it's a transformative scene um, or, or hybrid transform, transformation person, completely fascinating. Uh, giving birth to this child that, whose head is covered with globes. She's already had a child, it, it appears, um, who's on the ground. And it's a traditional birthing scene. Um, I was told, you know, back in the day when a woman gave birth, they would birth on a piece of plywood out in the, tide, on, in the tundra. Mm -hmm. And that's certainly both the birthing mother's scenes have that. Um, and the beautiful background, which, you know, I, I envy the people in Yukon who can see it, just the intricacy of, of the stones and all done in a fine liner pen, just fantastic background. Um, and then the, the midwife bird in both, both of these, uh, birthing scenes seem to be embracing and calming like there's nothing traumatic um except for maybe that pink claw i haven't you know but that maybe that is that is the pain you know that is um her representation but but there's such creative and fantastic pictures like you just have to wonder i know shuvenai has one daughter grown daughter um she says it's not autobiographical. Um, she rarely speaks about her work. Um, very difficult to interview. Um, and uh, yeah, but an ex exceptional example of how she can take uh, something and transform it like so subtly that, you know, I don't, I, I think I looked at this picture for years and like didn't notice the caribou um, poke like yeah. uh, the leg <laughs> because the drawings are so rich you could look you could find something every time you look at them so um i think this is a beautiful example and again quite large format this was in my memory probably around six feet by six feet or so yeah that sounds about uh, right yeah. you know and just the amount of detail and the composition and the colors and like why the blue hair and yet the blue hair is really what centers the picture so um i'm i'm just in awe of, of her her talent yeah um i have just a couple more questions and then we'll we'll uh call out to our audience i see that there are already some questions coming in um and uh so uh so many people and and we've touched on this so many people seem to envision inuit artists as focused on you know, traditional subjects, um, you know, polar bear, um, uh, birds, sea life. Uh, but Chauvenet is really, you know, pulling in all sorts of contemporary life and pop culture. Um, and, uh, and so right after your answer, we'll take a look at Titanic. But, uh, but I wanted to sort of, you know, get your take on, on Chauvenet's sort of interweaving of these traditional and then contemporary pop life images well i think you know she's symbolic of so many young people living in in the north or being urban inuit you know it, it her life is informed by many things like certainly you know traditional life uh, like like hunting and camping are you know certainly alive and well in the arctic the animals haven't changed i think what's changed is 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 uh well two things one is Shuvenai is educated. She, you know, has access to technology, albeit very, very limited, but certainly grew up with some access to television. Uh, so she was like, we call her a fourth generation artist. Um, so she would have the, the same influence as anybody would. She's in a co contemporary person. Mm -hmm. um, and she would, you know, also be very, impacted by traditional uh, ways of life, traditional foods. Certainly in the North, you know, people are still following traditions. And in fact, there's been a real 
effort in the in the north to bring back a lot of the traditions the the sewing the beading the drawing the hunting the eating country food so you know i think she is what what she and i done and and what annie and some of the artists the fourth generation artists is that they are a combination of living with a foot in in a traditional world that was very accelerated. They were nomadic communities not that long ago. Um, and yet her generation is not. So, you know, they're still very informed by the past and you can see uh, traditional aspects or what we call traditional. Um, I don't know if that's exactly the word we would use, we would use because it's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. um, but a foot in one camp where she loves to go clamming and she loves to go berry picking and she would also, you know, loves films and horror films and, and you know, what like television. And so there's a bunch of, you know, she's just a product of her environment in many ways. Right, right. Um, so speaking of which, I'm going to uh, share my screen one last time and then we'll get to, I promise we'll get to uh, all these great questions that are coming in. Um, but it feels like, uh, so here it is, Titanic. Uh, <laughs> and it's uh, also a relatively you know, good sized drawing. Um, and this really seems to bring in this pop culture um, theme. Um, what's so fascinating about this for Shuvenai? Well, this is, you know, this is, some people have said, oh, I was surprised to see that in the show. And there's another Titanic drawing too, um, that is equally as excellent. It, it hasn't sunk yet, the other Titanic. Um, but this, the Titanic, the, the Cameron film, James Cameron film is, or at the time when I was working on the show, was Shuvenai's favorite movie. She'd seen it many times. And so, you know, certainly, I, you know, that would be something like she would be interested in drawing. There was also a very famous uh, boat accident um, in Cape Dorset in the 40s by uh, the Nascopi, which was a uh, supply ship. And it went down with like a year's worth of supplies for the community. Oh, the wow. So that was before she and I was born, but certainly, you know, epic uh, boat crashes or sinkings were, were part of it. Um, but this, I, you know, that may have informed, you know, somewhat of her fascination with boats because she has drawn the Nascopi as well. But what I love about this is, is you know the band is playing on the top deck it, you, you know the like you know the band plays on and there's people yeah. dropping but none of the people are like their mouths are open but they don't even seem that traumatized their skirts are flowing it's like their little umbrellas like it, you know it's a horrifying nightmare of, like the crash like the sinking of the titanic and yet like her attention to detail and the little boats and the band playing and the lights are on and again the beautiful composition where you can see where the boat has hit the iceberg and and the water beyond mm -hmm. uh, beautiful like the way the boat is angled on the page like you said it's a large drawing the rich red color that just balances the 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 boat perfectly um, and it's an anomaly. Like you would, you would not go and look at this picture as I would have 15 years ago when I first was visiting the North and go, oh, well, obviously an Inuit artist made that picture. Like it, it's really the unexpected. And I think that we're all guilty of expecting a certain imagery or a certain feeling or, you know, something other than a picture like this, which is a fantastic drawing done by an Inuit woman who was talking about or recording her memories of seeing a film, mm -hmm. yeah. um, perhaps referencing this, this other tragedy, but I'm not sure. But, uh, you know, I think we have to be mindful of how we look at images um, 
especially now that we look at them on screens, I make assumptions about what Inuit art should look like, what this kind of art should look like, what a photograph should look like. Um, oh, my kid could have done this. Uh, you know, like there's so many things that we come with assumptions without, you know, really thinking, you know, Shuvanai is a woman who's living in, in Canada making contemporary art and blowing people's minds. She's an amazing artist and um, that's, that's, she can draw whatever she wants. So yeah, I yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, you and I, we, we chatted just a couple of days ago and, uh, yeah. and I think, you know, it's like contemporary art is a, a living artist who's making art and, yeah. and so, you know, all these other labels and expectations are, are really, uh, you know, very challenging and often very misplaced. Yeah. Um, so I really, I want to turn to, uh, to questions from the audience because some really great ones have come in. Um, and I think, you know, this is a, a great springboard. What you and I have just, just chatted, a question came in from, I'll just go with first names. Daniel has asked, as art critics, how does one analyze Inuit art? I was thinking for Western art, there's a long tradition, but it seems like, uh, but it seems uh, there's a long academic thought, but in Inuit art, perhaps, um, you know, it's new to Western audiences. So how, uh, you know, do you have uh, advice, we'll say, for Western audiences to, um, to glean the most from the experience? Well, he's, he's very, Correct, and there's very little literature on Inuit art, very little academic literature. Um, it is a shorter history. Uh, of course, Inuit were nomadic peoples up in, until the beginning of the 1900s. So they weren't dragging papers and pencils and big pieces of stone around with them. Um, they certainly made objects and and knives and toys, um, but drawing was brought in, in in the late 40s as an economic engine. I'm, I'm speaking, you know, to, specifically to Kingite, not, but it does apply to other communities as well, but just for sake of uh, clarity, um, as an economic engine for uh, people that, displaced people that were brought to the community and, um, needed work their their whole life changed so it's a a very short history and so as a western art critic you know i think it would be prudent to you know at least brief yourself on you know the unique history of inuit art which is very different from other indigenous arts mm -hmm. but also you know look if you're writing about contemporary art there should be very little discrimination between what what has value or not you know you have to always be careful about assumptions no matter where the artist is from and so I would um, you know there's there's very little written right. about with art but there certainly is you know some um, great uh, anthologies and and increasingly more uh, literature mm -hmm. on on this short history and there is a book on Shuvenai th that uh, Art Canada Institute published an online publication. Uh, they've also published something on Kitsila grandmother, and they've also uh, published um, one on Annie Kudugu. So. Those are three resources you can get online through the Art Canada Institute that would give you a background into into some of the uh, yeah literature. And uh, and so uh, so for those who have joined us online, because uh, I know there's a, a very small audience there at Yukon Arts Center, um, but for those who have joined us online, Mike, Mike Thomas's camera is uh, sort of can, you know can rove around the exhibition as we're as we're talking. Um, a really great question came in from uh, from one of the live audience members um, there in Whitehorse. Uh, why pencil crayons? Uh, you know, traditionally Inuit art way, way back was like very small carved objects yes. and became graphical with printmaking, um, you know, thanks to, you know, well, thanks to uh, James Houston. Um, but why pencil crayons? Well, the story has it, and I, I believe it to be true. When the co-op started, when like all the prints were made from drawings, 
uh, although those drawings were rarely sold as drawings, they were just archived and the best ones. Oh, that's a beauty, that picture there. Yeah. Um, the, you know, what they would consider a drawing that would make a, the most attractive print would be chosen to be a print drawing in the annual print release. So because of that, currently, uh, you know, there's over 100,000 drawings archived at the McMichael Canadian Art Collection that were just never sold or used as prints. So um, that's interesting. But back to the pencil crayon story is paint would freeze. And so they mm -hmm. would, you know, have pencils and pencil crayons were quite stable and you could get a nice range of colors. And, and the artists seemed to like using them. There was a period where they tried uh, felt tip markers, but they were not stable. And if you've seen any of those drawings, they're practically invisible now. So it's good they got rid of those. Um, and they've tried paint up there now that of course you could, it just, it never seems to catch on. There's some oil stick pastel they try, but the artists like pencil crayons, they're easy to use. They're easy to take home from the studio. You've got lots of colors and, um, but the initial reason is that they did not freeze. Right. Um, and another, you know, as we, as we look at this drawing of multiple worlds, each sort of with its, um, its, its type of life, well, so like its category. So there's fish and there's clams and um, uh, uh, maybe walrus, seals, yeah, um, sure. birds, avian theme. Um, thinking about, you know, hybrid transformations, um, there's this question, Bear Mountain um, also mentioned, you know, the monster imagery. How could you explain that hybrid transformation? Like what's some of that origin um, or perhaps mythical like imagery that we in the West, you know, may interpret? Um, well, so I can only really speak for Shuv and I, how, you know, that she, I've seen transformations in other indigenous cultures and, and, and you do see some in, in some of the older Inuit drawings, but not the way Shuv and I does. Like Shuv and I really aspires to have, and I know this sounds cliche, but everyone to get along. You know, like when the animals all became, they had a meeting of the animals and the animals all wanted to be friends, even the scary animals that were in the movies. I remember she said, um, you know, here she has, she's taking a picture of a bunch of polar bears playing on her belly. Um, <laughs> in, the, in the first image you showed with the different planets, with the different types of sea life. I don't know if she was categorizing, like, what if the world looked like this? Or what if the world looked like this? Or what if the world looked like this? Um, her transformation, I wouldn't put in the same category as, as an, another, um, like a transformation, like you'd see in a totem pole or something, a hide up piece, you wouldn't, Hers are certainly more fluid. The piece here at the bottom, that's the one where she said she wished all the people and the planets and the animals would get along and everyone would be friends and they're all holding hands. And, and it's really such a joyful picture, but you do see uh, different animals or people that like a planet with arms, you see, um, like a, a crab leg and a, a scorpion mouth. Mm -hmm. You see, you know, a, an Arctic char lying on the back of a seal, on the back of a polar bear. Um, I think, I think her, I, I don't know if I call it transformation, but it would be more of a, you know, a, a happy coexistence, I would say, than, you know. Yeah. And so I think, you know, that feeds very well into this, you know, question that has also come in. Um, does the artist go to church or observe any other spiritual practices? And does any related imagery show up in her work? Uh, Shiv and I, as a young child, went to church. There are five churches in Cape Dorset. Um, 
five different faiths. Um, she no longer does uh, by choice. Uh, she had, I think she, she didn't have the best experience with uh, religion in, um, as a young or a teen uh, person. Um, so you do, you, you, I have seen some religion or religious based iconography in some drawings, but certainly none in this exhibition. And that was when she was younger, um, mm -hmm. you know, different exorcisms or, um, uh, you know, a picture of a priest, but, uh, that's certainly not, I would say, something that's in her wheelhouse. Yeah, not not a, a, a typical sort of... But you do uh, see it in some artists, for sure. So it's a good question. Yeah. Um, and, and really, you know, I think, like, two last questions that sort of feed one another, um, which is... Um, so start with, with the, we'll say, the penultimate question, which is um, about Chauvinai's influence on other artists you know, a younger artist perhaps coming up in the co-op now. Um, uh, what, what could you uh, tell us about that? Well, I, I have no, no doubt that she's a huge influence. Um, there's fewer and fewer artists coming to the co-op, unfortunately, the, you know, well, fortunately they're finding work. Mm -hmm. Now with the pandemic, they're finding, uh, you know, some support, which is great, but um, it's really seen as a vocation there. And Chauvinai has done very well financially, not compared to Southern artists, but in terms of Northern artists, she, she makes her living and does a, a great job and wins awards and, you know, her, her work's being shown all over the world. So I think people are, are they're not laughing at Chauvinai anymore. They're not saying, you know, well, she was really like doing her thing. Um, I think she has prompted artists to uh, trust their instinct a little bit more, if I could say that. Mm -hmm. And um, I think she's helped raise the, the prices of Inuit art, which were in my mind so historically low that it was insulting um, for a contemporary artist or any artist to um make so little um yeah. so i think you know certainly shubhanai is is now put 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 um herself on an equal playing field with other um contemporary artists um we'll see what comes out like i she has to have an impact because she's her work is so different just like kanoyuak did and annie pudugu did and you know, you can go see, well, and artists are still like, Kavaval Maname was in the Toronto Biennial, you know, he's been making work for years, people have discovered him again, but yeah, there's no question that, uh, I think she will, she will be in the history books as, uh, as one of the critical shifts um, in Inuit art, um, just by nature of, of the way she's been exhibited and promoted. And, uh, and so I guess that's, you know, gives rise to the, to the last question that I really have. Um, and, uh, you know, I think I've gotten through the majority of the, of the, uh, the our viewers questions as well, is uh, what do, you know, if, if you could hazard a guess, what, I, I guess, what do you envision is, uh, is, you know, in keeping for Chauvenai, you know, as we move forward? Um, Monday to Friday, nine to five. I don't think that's going to change. Oh, those are enormous drawings, by the way. If, if yeah. I can move back, they're like about ten feet tall. Yeah. Um, anyway, it doesn't matter. I just I I like seeing them. I would, you know, my only wish for Shubhani is, as with all of you know, all of us, is that she stay healthy. She's quite frail, and uh, uh, for that she can stay working, that she can stay healthy. And, um, you know, I think she'll work until she can't work. 
and you know as we're all isolated I, I, I you know I hope she stays safe and um, as for you know what comes out of her hand next I have no idea um, she is getting a little bit older um, and you know you can imagine how much energy um, it would take oh, I just see the question she was born in 1961 um, but she's lived a very hard life, um, a lot, a good portion. She lived on the land. She, her parents went back. And so she spent at least, you know, from the age of like 18 to 28 living like nomadically. She's, you know, she's incredible human being. She's, you know, I just, I just hope she stays healthy and strong and um, no matter what she does I'm sure it will be incredible but you know she stopped tomorrow she's made an incredible contribution to Canadian art and I'm so delighted that she's been recognized not only with the show at the power plant but with the Gershon Iskowitz award yeah. and you know she was in the fade and drawing catalog which is an international catalog of, of draft people and um you know i just i think she's just like so amazing so i guess we'll just have to wait and see and just keep our fingers crossed that uh the north stays safe and uh we all can go out and look at art again soon yeah, well, I mean, I think, you know, uh, along those end, you know, along those lines, I think you've done just such remarkable work, um, you know, uh, with such dedication traveling up to the north, you know, when that is possible, again, uh, nobody really knows, but um, certainly I hope, I hope you have many more years of engaging um, with, um, you know, with the north. Um, I know the show at Yukon Arts Center uh, continues uh, until Friday, November 27th. Um, so, uh, you know, thank you so much, Nancy, for joining us today and answering all of our questions um, and sharing your perspective on on some some of, you know, these, you know, just amazing drawings by Shuvanai Ashuna. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Mary. And thank you, Yukon Art Center. Enjoy the show. Thank you.